We're so grateful that you've chosen to spend the next hour or so with us. Uh, my name's Hamad Nasser, um, and I, alongside Rosie Attenbrook and, and Alice Swatton, have curated uh, Divided Cells, the exhibition upstairs. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, there will be a test. It. No, there won't, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, we would encourage you uh, to go up and take a look um, af after our talk. And one of the things uh, that that exhibition allowed us to do was to bring um, Fiona Banner's amazing work, Pranayama Organ, to Coventry. And not just to Coventry, we're proud to say that this is the first time the work has been shown in the UK. Now, for those of you who don't know Fiona, um, Fiona is, I think, one of the most thoughtful artists working in Britain today. Um, and that's not a new judgment. Uh, it's been around for decades. She was nominated for the Turner Prize uh, as far back as 2002. And rather than read you all the list of institutions that have honored her work and shown her, what we decided to do instead was to do a, a conversation in three parts. Uh, so roughly around 20 minutes each. So in that first 20 minutes, We'll sort of, I'll sort of give an introduction to Fiona, not through institutions and adjectives, but through a selection of her works. Uh, quoting Fiona back to you is, art is an experiment that should be carried out in public. Um, and I think the exhibition is where the art meets its public. Um, and given you know, that spirit, that's what we wanted to project in the, the first third. In the second third, we wanted to actually talk a little bit and explicate uh, the wonderful film installation, Pranayama Organ, that for those of you who haven't seen it, would encourage you to go upstairs and, and take a look. And then we'll have at least 15, 20 minutes or so for opening up the conversation uh, and don't worry, there's no pressure. If you don't have a question, there'll be plenty, for, I'm sure, for us to natter on about, but would encourage you to ask those questions uh, when they come. So with that, uh, what we've done, and the process we followed was uh, we had a, the briefest of conversations, because the last thing we wanted to do was to have the conversation before we do the conversation. Um, so what we did was to, what Fiona sort of shared with me her, uh, I think it was called Master PowerPoint, which had about 100 odd slides. Uh, and as counter offer, I sent back about 20 odd slides. And we've settled at around 40. Um, we will zip through them. So the idea is not this again, there will be no test. Um, but what we wanted to do was really just to share with you a cluster of works um, experiments around uh, a series of ideas. And then some of those ideas we'll take with us as we start talking about pranayama organ. Um, with that, we'll start. Uh, and the work I'm showing here is called The Artist as a Publication. It dates back to 2009. You can see the ISBN number tastefully letter set somewhere above the, the nude body again. So you're thinking about the ideas that we're going, uh, that are in play here, about the idea of the publication as, as, an, as an exercise in finding a public, you know, as, uh, as the distribution of ideas, but also thinking about publication itself and publishing as a kind of a performance. Uh, and that also gets us into those ideas of the economy, of how does art circulate, how do books circulate? And what can artists do in, in terms of arbitrating between these two different modes of circulation? So this is the actual work, but I think the work continues um, with this wonderful uh, letter from the British Library asking Fiona to say, well, you know, there's this ISBN, um, but you haven't deposited anything in the British Library. And then there's this lovely response back uh, in which uh, you know, there's, there's something slightly absurd, but very polite. So there's this polite absurdity in what, I th what, I, what comes across almost as like workshopping. How does an artist uh, deposit 
herself in the British Library. Um, and, and this ends with actually that deposit slip. Um, again, this is a form that's used for books, uh, but this is about the artist herself describing herself as a book. So it's about an exchange with institution. It's about, you know, also those ideas of the nude. I mean, I remember one of the first public exhibitions for which a big catalog was done for me was back in, uh, in 2005 at the Aldrich. And the publishing director there, because when we were talking about how many should be print, it was like, no, no, not more than 2,000. Nothing except the nude sells more than 2,000. So when I asked, well, well, you know, how do the nude sell? He said, well, we printed 2,000. We're now on our third reprint. <laughs> so, so I think there's something also around what distributes and in what quantity that, that's, uh, that's wrapped into to this work. Uh, just continuing on that theme, so this uh, is a, a helicopter blade, but you can see that this also is carrying an ISBN number. This is just a gratuitously cute photograph uh, <laughs> of the blade with the dog. Uh, you're getting the picture. And this, then, is an Airfix model. You remember Airfix, folks? Uh, and this was the model of the Harrier that uh, Fiona built. And this was in her studio, leading up to this magnificent work uh, in the Devine Gallery of Tate Britain in 2011. I think the work itself was 2010, but the display was 2011. And there is, you know, there is both a beauty but a certain awkwardness here. Yeah? It uh, recalls, I, I think, Patricia Bickers, who talked about it as a Vitruvian man. And again, that link to Leonardo da Vinci is interesting because for his interest in flight. Uh, but there's also there's something about planes as a kind of sculpture, but also as nature. The fact that this is a harrier. Uh, it, it is, you know, the fact that so many planes are named after birds or uh, natural events. I think, you know, the typhoon that we will see later on is very much in play here. And again, links us back to this, you know, that uh, the fact that this is happening on Earth Day uh, makes it very, very appropriate. And again, you know, so here you see uh, people looking up at the play. There's something sort of very phallic going on here. Uh, and I think this is also one of the great, uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about Fiona's art is that it hits you in at least a couple of part, bo body parts, everything. You know, so there's something to do with the language and conceptual art that hits your head. There's something at a level of feeling uh, that hits your heart. And there's some, something primal that can get to your gut or zones even lower than that. Uh, we, we move on to the next airfix, and this is the Jaguar. It's a, it's a different display, and, and you can see the kind of the sheen. So there's almost like a mirrored surface. So for anybody who would go across this, they would see themselves reflected. And this is also super interesting because it raises that issue about our own uh, complicity in the politics that we live in. You know? So those ideas of war and how that actually plays out in democracies. Uh, we all remember you know, the Falklands. Uh, we all remember uh, Boris Johnson rushing over as frequently as he possibly could to the Ukraine. Uh, so I think there, there's a wider narrative at play here. And this, this work sort of for me sort of remind, uh, you know, it's, it's like a reminder that uh, we have to think about our own political agency in these, uh, in these exchanges. And then, there you go. Those massive sculptures are transformed into ingots. Continuing the, that sort of exploration of uh, of geometric sculptures. Um, these are a body of works known as the full stop sculptures. Now the full stops, or, or as the Americans would call it, period, um, and that in that 
wordplay, again, there's that idea of both language, but also the body and, and bodily function in, in, in play here. So the full stop is, is about a gap in language, about or, or, or perhaps where language stops and where the imagination uh, takes over, or where you're invited in to imagine what could be a response. Fiona, in talking about them, has, has called them, they animate you, you animate them. Um, and, and this little YouTube video, so don't worry, it is that fuzzy, even if you go, it's not just a projection, quite literally shows people <laughs> animating them. And the first time I saw this, it was like, okay, can he nail this? <laughs> I really want him to nail this. Yes. That, uh, All right. Which he does. And then they take different forms. They take flight. Here you see, um, I think this is the Delaware Pavilion, isn't it? Um, so th these are actually dirigibles. <coughs> they become paintings. So these are found paintings that Fiona has. Um, sort of obscured whatever battleship uh, that was on these oceans, they become full stops. And these particular full stops, uh, wonderfully and evocatively titled as Peanuts, Clang, and Orator, were produced in 2020 as part of an action by Greenpeace. So you see the Greenpeace activists here depositing I think this is Clang outside the DEFRA office. Here we see peanuts being hoisted onto a ship and deposited on Dogger Bank. So we've got to the Barra Boys comma a space comma breath period, a pause period, the call for a space comma the Barra Boys situation. We've got to the Barra Boys. This is Orator, also finding its way. And what you heard briefly was Fiona reading what she's called a, a squid poem. Um, and that's been sort of reproduced in the publication that you're all very welcome to take away. Um, and I, I wanted to just sort of point out where it ends. And it ends with that idea of hope and thinking about activism, Greenpeace, Earth Day, the fact that these uh, sculptures, because they go into the bottom of the sea, can act as a deterrent for trawler fishing. Um, uh, you know, bringing that back into ideas of the landscape, uh, about the environment, about nature. The same sculptures as a painting. And now, this is where I uh, encountered uh, Fiona's pranayama organ. This is Venice. Uh, it's a children's basketball court set within a converted church. Again, you see that sort of play with language, idea of competition and of poetry. Uh, runway, the, the sort of photographs that uh, as you can probably just make out on the left here, uh, that they're, they're cut from a magazine. The magazine was a Korean edition of Vogue, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little later on. But you, you see this work as you enter uh, and, and as you leave the exhibition. So it's not in the same space uh, as the film itself. And then we move to Pranayama organ. And given that maybe perhaps some of you have not seen the film upstairs, we prepared a little clip. It's about five minutes of extracts, uh, which we will play. Um, and then we'll start our conversation.
Let's start by saying thank you, Fiona. Oh, thank you for not an amazing for introduction. No, not just for being here, but for that work. Because oh. uh, so, every time I see it, and we were having a conversation as to how long the clip should be, because uh, people who've seen it before, you know, will they, will we be testing their patience? And, I, and my sort of response was to say, look, I've seen this so many times, <laughs> and, and I can see this on loop, <laughs> you know, per perpetually. Um, and, and I'm sure some of you will, uh, if not all of you who've seen it, will, will agree. Um, and I wanted to start by, uh, by actually trying to understand how you made it. Uh, because we, even just those little extracts show you, there, it's, there's so many characters here. Yeah. There is uh, the planes themselves, uh, which we've been introduced to. With, with you know in the past with uh, with her you know, with your earlier work, there's the music, uh, which is very much a full fledged character, um, the landscape itself, um, with those knowing shots of the, of the cliffs, the beach, that uh, that encounter between the land and the sea and the sky, um, the I mean I I noticed this time around the birds much more. Uh, than I have previously, and I wonder it's because I was thinking about that connection. Language. There's language as song, there is humming, there is breath, the, the name itself, pranayama. Uh, so how did, you know, how did all of this come together? How did you decide that this is the orchestration that you wanted to do in this piece? Um, well, first of all, I'm really interested in the question because it's, uh, it's important to recognise that when, uh, when you're making work, when I'm making work, I'm not making it with all the answers. Mm. And um, I'm, you know, we're sitting here with the privilege of hindsight. And uh, I've come to understand quite a lot about this film in the year and a half since uh, I've made it, partly because I've shown it quite a lot. And that's, uh, you know, you can just kind of gauge and, and, and learn about the, uh, the kind of um, uh, frequency of the work uh, when you show it. But um, I guess to begin with the title, um, uh, Pranayama organ, uh, pranayama, yes, as in breath, organ as in the body, um, as in um, uh, the lungs, as in the breath, uh, as in the phallus, as in uh, the cock, as in the bird, as in the falcon, as in flight, as in air, as in um, typhoon, as in destructive force increasingly uh, present in nature in these turbulent times, this turbulent relationship uh, that we have with nature at the moment. Um, so it all sort of came together, I think, through a, a feeling around these elements and the two uh, main protagonists within the film, as, as, as you've um, reference there are many uh, characters in the film but the two main protagonists are a um, a falcon a fighting falcon and um, a typhoon Eurofighter typhoon so they're both uh, aircraft that are currently in service which is an important element <coughs> because we're sort of uh, somehow involved in these aircrafts there's an element of culpability and uh, you know, they're not, we can't view them with uh, the sort of uh, patina of uh, nostalgia that might be associated with historic aircraft, for instance. Um, and uh, they are both um, uh, sort of placebos in that they are uh, military decoy aircraft. So I actually bought them uh, from China, in fact, the factory that supplies the military. So is this um, an eBay purchase? or? Uh, Alibaba. Alibaba. Um, sort of yeah. Alibaba. Yeah. And, uh, and th so those particular types of aircraft were important to me partly because of the names. 
So, you know, there's strange um, irony, I guess, um, that these aircraft are named after nature, and yet, obviously, they speak of anti-nature in, in so many ways, or are anti-nature in, in so many ways. Um, and, and then there are other characters in the film, uh, in that I'm one of the actors, uh, uh, a fellow artist who works with me at, at the studio, Kirsty Kirsty Harris is also uh, features in the film, and we made these uh, small uh, costume size versions of the aircraft to uh, sort of, I, I guess, uh, help us in performing uh, some strange. Uh, rituals around um, encounter and combat. So I think as, as the uh, experience of making the film, which was, uh, you know, I'd see as largely a, a sort of performative, um, uh, sort of quite th theatrical experience really making the film, um, we, I, I, I came to realise that we were trying to act out or perform this this dream and that dream was around emasculating the tools of conflict but as these two characters come together and sort of perform or, or dream a dream of um, coalescence they come face to face with their own demise because they are killer machines and, and this choice of making a film was this you know was this the form right from the start, or did you have earlier iterations where it was a sculpture, a performance? Yeah, yeah. many. Um, and in fact, this sort of uh, was one of those iterations in that this may well have been, uh, the material that formed this film may well have been uh, a test shoot or may well have been a per performative moment that was filmed. I didn't really know at the time, but I uh, went down to the coast uh, during deep lockdown uh, with some friends, one of which is here, Alice Walters, who produced the film. And, uh, well, you were two metres apart all, all, at all times. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very strange because we had to go at dawn yeah, yeah. Um, so that nobody was on the beach. Yeah. Um, and then that sort of became part of the weird, eerie light of the film. Um, and of course, people did eventually tip up on the beach and were slightly <laughs> slightly alarmed by what <laughs> might be going on. And then there was a strange confusion because one of the um, characteristics of that particular bit of uh, coast is that quite a lot of migrants have made the crossing and landed on that area. And then, of course, they, are, they leave the um, grey inflatable boats behind. Um, so I've had many visceral experiences of being there when, when people have, have landed at the end of you know very, very arduous and intense journey on, on that spot. So there, is, there are many things to do with the, uh, the particular area, because there's a, this petrified coast uh, the forest underneath the seabed there, so it sort of speaks of different um, uh, times, you know, deep time, deep space, changing coastlines. And also, um, I think, just a, a time of uh, preca precarity that we were all in at that, a time of, of you know, deep unknowingness uh, and a loss of confidence that um, we were all, all in at that point in, um, in the pandemic probably informed some, some elements of the film. And really, I, I didn't quite, you know, I didn't quite know what I, um, how it was going to end up, but I knew I wanted it to feel profoundly romantic and um, uh, also profoundly unresolved in, in, in a sense. And that um, I all along had this uh, uh, talisman of uh, Wild is the Wind, the song. So the, um, the soundtrack's a very broken down version of, of that. Um, of that song, and there's something about the uh, sense of unrequited uh, love, but also um, unrequited relationship or unrequitable relationship uh, between man and nature within that song that, um, that sort of drew me through the film and, and uh, gave me a, uh, a way of 
uh, I sort of gave me a soundtrack really to work to, but then it wasn't until quite close to the end that I realised, well, I have to record, make the, the, so the song anew, and I ended up going to a, 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 a deserted church with some friends, and we recorded the soundtrack at that, at that point with this sort of rather overblown, um, slightly grandiose, verbose uh, way of, uh, I, I suppose, you know, using the uh, coercive uh, history or emotional history um, and uh, religiosity of, of, the, of the organ, but then going back to the lungs, to the body, to yeah. the blood. Yeah, I mean, and that, that, that organ, the pranayama organ, is, is what you hear and kind of feel almost yeah. before you see the yeah. film. Yeah. Uh, it kind yeah. of leads you in. Yeah. Uh, and in some way becomes that the almost a, a leading character. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, you know of, the, of, yeah. The, of the film. Yeah. But I, I actually, I just suddenly thought I didn't answer your question, mm. which was um, that I had one of these uh, inflatable aircraft, these you know, full-scale yep. decoy aircraft in my studio. Uh, and I realised I wanted to do something with it. I had it for quite a long time. And um, it was... I realised I wanted it sort of to be, to be breathing, to be moving. I didn't want it to be a sort of static uh, sculpture raw element. Uh, and I was drawn to the absurdity of this sort of almost toy-like and, and yet actual military element, um, sort of somehow cutely brutal, so it's quite dangerous really. And, um, and yet sculpturally it wasn't quite working. So I started making little films of it to send um, to people. I was working with Alice at the time and we were uh, working remotely. So it sort of naturally started to become a film because that's how I was communicating about this um, thing that became slowly became a creature to me and that's what led into this um, this thing being a film not not anything else it might have been a sculpture it might have been a text it might have been a sound piece but sort of all came together in uh, through a, through this time-based medium of film and, and this particular stretch of the coast um, and uh, that you talked about where it was shot um, what meaning does that have in the film beyond uh, this, you know, what you've talked about in terms of... Um, I think one of the things you brought up and this I hadn't picked up was the, uh, that idea of passage um, yeah. and migration and, um, and quite often not just the mi you know, war being one trigger <coughs> for migration and if anything, you know, quite frankly, we you ain't seen nothing yet, because what the climate will do to migration pressures is perhaps yeah. uh, a, a multiple of what we've seen so yeah. far in human history as a result of war. Yeah. So that relationship, um, was, was that sort of written into the landscape, or are we now reading it, as, as you're saying, after one and a half years of you, know, you making it? It is written into the landscape, um, and that the um, piece of sea that we're looking out on in the film is is the channel, is is really important. So the stretch of uh, water between us and mainland Europe, you know, uh, a, a very uh, emotional uh, piece of water, but also, you know, is it? It's used as a crossing, but it's uh, often. Uh, as much as a, a, a conduit, it's a, a barrier or a border, um, and that that particular uh, bit of uh, cliff is constantly eroding. Is you know, it, it does speak of um, of the need to, I suppose, the fragility of. Uh, I want to say the fragility of borders, really, and. Um, it's meant quite a lot to me to show this film in the context of, of this wider exhibition, actually, because one, one thing that I really um, I find pr profound about the exhibition upstairs is how it brings together these elements of, um, yes, climate, yes, conflict, yes, 
uh, uh, crossings, yes, uh, borders, um, and it's um, it's a very uh, you know it's very fra fra in a very it's well it's held in a very fragile way in the ex ex exhibition I think and all all of those elements are also present in this film and how you make decisions when you're making a piece of work I think is at its best sort of has the or almost the tenor of of a very lucid dream where y you kind of understand it but it hasn't gone into the space that we are now in where we are articulating it yeah. so it's sort of pre-verbal and that also was a very uh is, is a sort of important element within that film somehow that it has this sort of non non-verbal element to it al although it, pff, language is all around it yeah. We'll, we'll talk to lang you know, we'll get to language, but one of the things that um, I think really struck me was this, uh, I suppose it's bathos, or, or maybe perhaps bathos. There, there's almost a, um, there's a reluctance that one can feel in this duel slash dance uh, between the falcon and, uh, and the typhoon. Um, and, and I don't know if, if it's the music, it's the choreography or something in between. How, how did you achieve that or um, orchestrate that? Um, I mean, I, I, would, I would say they are reluctant, they are forlorn, and they are stuck in this combative bind. Um, it's not that they want to be there, it's that they don't know another way of being. So. I guess I was think I was thinking about I suppose how we are stuck somehow in a mode of conflict. You know, there is this eternal need for us to uh, through I, I guess through a desire to um, for ownership, one way or another. Uh, even if that's something spiritual or religious or dr driven by religion, it's uh, we're, we're stuck in it, this eternal conflict. What, you know, we are in a bind. And actually at this point, uh, uh, we're all very particularly aware that we're stuck in a, 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 an eternal bind with, with nature. You know, we've kind of, uh, we don't want to be in conflict with nature, but we are. So I, I guess throughout all my work, I am uh, kind of exploring my own and our own uh, stupidity um, or dumbness. And ha ha you know how, I, I'm, I'm always trying to break out of that. <laughs> I mean, as we are trying to break out of it, but we just seem sort of drawn back into the sort of our, our own limitations, you know, so. Um, there is, the film, which is called Pranayama Organ, then there are the bean bags, and if you haven't yet experienced the bean bags, <laughs> you must, because they are an essential part of the work. Um, then there are the um, the cutouts from the Korean Vogue, and then there are the sort of the textual takeaways. Um, could you talk us a little bit about these elements as to um, your choice to have them? <laughs> And, and what they do um, in conversation and dialogue with the, w with, with yeah. the film. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, I'll just take it piece by piece. Yeah, I please. feel you're asking a bigger question, yeah. but I'll ask, I'm going to answer it in a, a relatively yeah. mundane way, perhaps. But the, um, the bean bags, soft parts, um, I, I, I call the bean bags. They sort of loosely take the form of wings, fins, um, noses. So I guess they refer back to the body and the fact that, you know, we all, 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 all note or I am mindful uh, of the fact that we always have a body. It's not like we can go and see some art and suddenly we don't have a body anymore. So how are we seeing this art and, um, or this film? And in the particular case of Pranayama Organ that I wanted, uh, the viewers to be uh, somehow performatively engaged 
um, or bodily engaged with the um, body of the aircrafts in the film, and it felt like to be reclining was the right, right attitude. modus, yeah. yes. Um, and then with the text, uh, I guess the text is a sort of slight spoof text of a um, what you might normally identify as a gallery guide. So um, the main main uh, the, the initial text came from a, uh, a collaboration with uh, that I did with a writer um, Tom McCarthy, and. The initial invitation, which actually came from a gallery in Korea where I was showing this, uh, this piece, was to uh, sort of engage in an expl explanatory uh, conversation around the work. Sort of could be a bit like this, but more. Anyway, whatever. And we, we thought, well, all of that's a theatre anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, so we ended up making this absurdist play where he took on the, Tom took on the character of T, Typhoon, and I took on the character of F, Falcon. So it sort of uh, is a kind of meta uh, piece, I suppose, or an, a side piece to the, um, to the film. I, I guess, I mean, even though I am here trying, you know, fumbling through in normal language uh, or conventional uh, means, uh, the, uh, uh, an explanation of the work, it's not, I, I am aware of the absurdity of that. So often it feels more comfortable to me to make a sort of, uh, perhaps a poet poetic uh, digressionary... Uh, or a bridge, almost, yeah. into... Yeah, or maybe to, to create humour from it, yeah. I guess. And um, the um, squid, for, for squid, not quid, uh, text that you um, put up on the slides there, um, which was a sort of manifesto that I read when the um, full stop sculptures were being deployed from the Greenpeace ship, the es Esperanza. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Uh, you know, it's a, you know sculptures for a poor with a poi pois. You know, sculptures <laughs> that are for squid, not quid. Mm period, et cetera, but it, it, it's a sort of, it's a joke, but it's not a joke, if you know what I mean. So I, I do find that sort of agency of, uh, that, that some, some humour or, or some kind of uh, absurdist theatre brings, uh, is, is quite a, a helpful uh, decoy, if you like, to having to uh, re resort to, uh, explanation. Do you want to talk <laughs> about the, the last bit, which was the, uh, the Korean Vogue and the, and, and the photo shoot and runway? Yeah. Um, so that came about because I was showing the um, film in Seoul, South Korea, and I was invited by uh, Korean Vogue to do a, a uh, photo shoot in, in the gallery uh, alongside the show with the idea that they could get me in some seriously expensive garb and, you know, I could <laughs> glamorously pose with a fighting falcon, you know. Uh, however, um, that didn't happen. But I, I did start to think, ah, uh, the performative space that this uh, luxury magazine can offer is quite an interesting one. So uh, I did the, a, a shoot, in fact, uh, in London with um, somebody who used to be, Emma Summerton, who, who was my um, first ever studio assistant, who's now a, a top uh, Condé Nast photographer. And we um, made this sort of, uh, I guess, parody of uh, a runway. So drawing on the idea of the fashion catwalk and the um, runway of uh, aircraft and sort of, I, I think in, in the case of uh, some of those photographs, they, they do feel very, uh, very sad and very kind of uh, end, end of the affair, you know, the uh, end of luxury and that the, the garments uh, are these sort of de often deflated aircraft that look like 
big dying fish, etc. So it sort of was was really uh, there was a lot of pathos to to that. But yeah, it was again an, an, a, a really good site. The the magazine was a really good site for that work, actually. Yeah. I mean that's perhaps the the sort of the larger question that you referred to that I was getting at is um, this uh, this interest, and we've seen it in the earlier works as well. Is you know you're uh, you're interested in dealing directly with institutions, with the British Library, with uh, the Devine, uh, with with the Air Force or the idea of, of the military um, as a presence, with DEFRA, with Greenpeace. Um, there is this, uh, I think there's this impulse for you to want to play with them. Um, the interest in ideas of circulation um, and, and thinking literally about how your work circulates uh, and how people may be able to access it as the publication, as the photograph, as as you know, I can easily see a soundtrack uh, for this as well, kind of you know being dropped on on SoundCloud, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, s somewhere, um, and and that that whole you know the polite the polite absurdity of it all, you know, there's a uh, it's all doing this without it's not a very shouty kind of you know practice. Um, and one of the things uh, when we, because I'd seen the work in Venice and I thought you know, it was one of my favorite things in Venice and we're already working on this exhibition. For those of you who haven't seen it, it takes up the four galleries. Um, sort of you, you can I welcome you to go up and take a look. And it's called Divided Cells and you enter the, the, the exhibition in a gallery which looks at nations as as a sort of division of geography, you know, that, that usually happen in history through an act of violence. So that's how you enter the show. Uh, that recognition that we all live in parts of the world that have been divided through violence. And you leave the exhibition through uh, a, a gallery in which, which looks at, at the nation not through geography, but through the sort of this idea, of Ben Anderson's idea of an imagined community. Um, that you know we are a nation because of the songs we sing and the food we eat and you know the the history we read. So Tudors twice, uh, nothing on the empire uh, in in schools. That's that's what shapes us. And of course, those things are kind of falling apart now. Uh, that 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 culture of the nation, thanks to technology, thanks to sort of certain forms of capitalism that we're living through. And then there. Uh, Fiona's and Jane and Louise Wilson's work uh, that sort of connects these two ideas of nation. Uh, these two ideas that are both kind of competing with each other, so there's an element of competition there, but there's also some element of play as to how do they both exist. So perhaps the one last sort of question, and you started talking about it a little bit, and then we'll open it up, is um, up till now, I think this was the first time your work, that this work was shown in a group exhibition context. Because uh, up till now it has been shown kind of on its own uh, with its various parts that allow people into uh, and out of it. Um, and you know, it's only been on for, the, for a few, well, a couple of months now. But I wonder if you've had a chance to think about what, what does showing within a group context do to the work or for the work um, that, you know, what, what parts does it reach or not reach compared mm. to um, showing it on its own? Mm. Actually, to begin with, I wasn't sure how the work would sit within this exhibition. Um, and now I really understand how it does sit within this exhibition. Uh, First of all, I'd say um, I don't. I don't think work is ever, you know, is ever read in isolation. So even though you saw it as part of a solo presentation in Venice, it's you know it's always suspended in context and it's always suspended in reference. And when we're making work, we're it's suspended in the past, the present, and the future, and. Uh, I guess within this exhibition, it's 
you've created a particular context where the question of uh, nationhood, the question of, I think, sort of empathy around nationhood as, as opposed to uh, sort of the uh, assumed brutality, brutality that's required or violence that's required to, to exist within a nation in, in, in many ways. So the sort of community dimension. There are lots of things that have come up in this exhibition that I hadn't thought about uh, uh, literally that uh, are present in the work that I think it does connect to. So it's brought out broader things. Um, and I also think just this sort of, it's important to reference that work is constantly changing. So I don't believe um, art is static. It's, uh, it's always seen through the context of, uh, of the present as well. And um, it's sort of, uh, so it's in motion and therefore uh, context is, is crucial. You know, for instance, I really, uh, you know, I love that um, halfway through this show, much as uh, I'm grateful to be in it, my work's going to shift and Hayden Patel's going to take... Who's in the audience here then? Hello, at that. <laughs> take, um, take that Ramon yeah. with very wonderful work. Um, and that'll, that'll shift again. And I just think that we must accept our flux and we must accept that we don't always really know and understand uh, how work is affecting us and, uh, you know, be open to the sort of, I suppose, the, the vulnerability of, of art as well as the uh, vulnerability of our, ourselves. Well, that's actually a great point because I'm mean, just thinking about it. You were describing when the work was being made which is in, in the context of well, both lockdown, but also sort of post-Brexit. Uh, but uh, what, when the work was shown in Venice, um, that was quite soon after you know, the Ukraine uh, yeah. uh, so, sort of ongoing yeah. conflict. And yeah. that created a very charged context yeah. for, 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 for the work. Yeah. Um, so I think that's actually a really great point. Yeah. Um, and perhaps at this point, we'll just sort of open up to the floor for any questions. You don't have to talk about this work, but also anything previously uh, that we shared. Hello. Um, what is your ultimate goal Hello. What is your ultimate goal as an artist? Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's a small question <laughs> to kick this off. Uh, to keep to keep making art, to keep, I guess, not quite knowing, um, and to keep questioning through through my work. So I suppose to. Uh, there's a sort of restlessness to my uh, practice, and I find that very, uh, I find it really challenging often, but I think ultimately to carry on doing that for uh, the rest of my life. Question back here. Hi. Hi. Um, I've only caught the last sort of 10, 15 minutes of the talk, and I've not um, had a look at the exhibition. I prefer to sort of, um, well, normally read up, but this is a real um, privilege to actually have the artists um, uh, speak about their um, art and ideas and concept, etc. So what I've taken from um, the last 10 minutes is that um, uh, the lady, uh, sorry, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Um, I think, I've, I'm, I'm getting a feeling that your work is timeless and it, it is transitional and it evolves and it's a part of you. Um, so, so there's a, a, a very deep connection there. Thank you. Thank you.
You're well, that was a beautiful and poetic response, and I wish you'd been here for the, for the rest of the 45 <laughs> minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I've got a, um, I was hoping to get here earlier, but I have a, a poppy that comes first, so, oh. yeah, so I'm going to have to get back pretty quick. <laughs> Bring the poppy so. next time. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I will have a look at the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. So do we have any more questions? Ah, here it is. Hi. No. It's for well, I can repeat the question if that, if that helps. Because that the mic's there also because this is being uh, recorded and it's being live streamed on YouTube so that people can hear the questions. Yeah, yeah, so congratulations on the exhibition and on the Thanks, film. Thanks, Atal. Um, and I was really taken by um, uh, the Harrier jet in the tape at the beginning and now the inflatable jets. Um, the inflatable jets being full of air and the uh, Harrier and the Jaguar f finishing as ingots. And I seem to remember once I asked you coming out of yoga, have you got a Harrier jet in your backpack? And, and actually you sort of just smiled and ran off and now I knew you were, what you were up to. Um, but so full of air, it, it, it's almost a t the timeless question, perhaps, um, is, is, is one thing. I didn't know, did, so the, the, the question itself is really banal one. Did the uh, Harrier Jet and the Jaguar sculptures, would they, did you melt them down to those ingots? Yes, yeah, so um, after, after the uh, duration of the exhibition, um, there was a question of what to do with the aircraft. Um, and um, I, I felt quite strongly, really, that they were um, public objects, that they shouldn't go into a uh, private collection. There were very few places, really, that I think could have held them well. And they also sort of became these fetish objects because of how they were displayed, one polished to a mirror, and um, the other sort of, I like this uh, court, sort of nature trophy. It just felt uh, very potent as well. Uh, I'd done a lot of research into the life of those aircraft uh, and connected with quite a lot of the pilots, etc., cetera, uh, in, in collating a, a sort of uh, CV, if you like, of those aircrafts, a biography of each of those aircrafts. And um, I, I, wasn't re I didn't really want to live with them. Um, and I, I owned them actually. I was quite quite clear with the um, with the tape that when um, once I, I found the particular planes that I wanted to work with, that um, I bought them personally. I mean, even though they funded the exhibition, it was important to me that that you know I held that transaction. I was responsible for that transaction. But you know, it's a kind of heavy thing to own in life, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And also, I, I sort of, I suppose because I am an iconoclast in many ways around the image, I didn't, I didn't really want to live with the image of them either, or I didn't want the image of them to live on. So um, I thought, well, two, two things. Um, I'd, I'd like to erase that image. Uh, but secondly, I'd s kind of like to uh, <coughs> store the idea. And then I thought, how do you store metal? Uh, well, you know, going back centuries, you store metal as ingots. So um, we, I took the planes apart. And in fact, I had to take them apart and almost reconstruct them in the space like Airfix. You would an Airfix model anyway, because that space at Tate doesn't preempt massive, great contemporary sculpture. It it's preempts a different scale and a different time of, of sculpture. Which so is part of the power of the piece when it's Yeah, hard. yeah. It was sort of exactly wrong in that sort of weird space, empire, uh, redolent uh, space. So, um, yeah, we took them apart and, and drove them up to uh, Wales where I melted them down and poured them into ingots and then stamped. Um, so the taxonomy retained, stayed with them and they're all stamped either Harrier, Harrier Hawk, Harrier Jump Jet uh, or, or, or Jaguar. Um, and yeah, now I've got loads of ingots. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we have 
time for one last question, if there's a... Yep, there's this one right there. I, just, I was just thinking about the idea of borders over the last, because it's sort of the idea of nationality, in order to have a nation, you have to have violence starts as the empires break down after the First World War. And over, and over that past hundred years, after, since the First World War, there's borders all over the place which never existed, accompanied by violence. And one of the things you hear in Ukraine is, from the Russian-speaking Ukraine, is I don't know what's happening to us. And you hear the same thing in when wall in Berlin, you hear the same thing in India with the Indian politician. And there's something with the dancing with the two objects in flux but not quite coming together. That's a bit sad in some ways. Because if you keep going high, then the borders disappear at some stage, I assume. Um, this one's increasingly the you're going to get more polarisation. There's something about the flux and that's a bit sort of I don't know, we're sad about where we are at. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I, I take, uh, take what you're saying. Um, I guess within, within the film that, that uh, aircraft are, 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 are grounded and also, you know, bound to us. We're not separate, separate from them is uh, is a key key element of, of the film. I mean, as you as you say, we're we're in we're playing out all around us is this horrendous uh, combat combati combative uh, uh, reality performance. You know, we see our our leaders posturing and uh, puffing themselves up, and uh, you know, I engaging in uh, potential peace talks, treaties, whatever, but really, you know, that's not what's going on. We're, we're kind of, uh, the, I think the distance or, or, or the gap or the, the inability to uh, coalesce is, you know, we're, we're, seeing that, we're seeing that played out in, on the big stage of global politics. And yeah, there are elements of that in, in the film as well. It is deeply, deeply sad and, um, where that leaves the uh, the next generation when we uh, think about the impact that that has on uh, yeah migration and uh, climate and everything is you know well it's it's sad to use your word yeah but not to end on that note although <laughs> I then get a on, uh, on that uh, upper <laughs> but, but I think one of the points here and and that's where I think the the tag team that you just referred to. So um, Fiona and Jane and Louise Wilson's film will run until the 4th of June. Uh, and then Hithen Patel and Aziz Hazara sort of you know, step into the ring. Um, and, and in a way, what, we're also, what they do with, with their work and bringing in new uh, different uh, perspectives and energies is to think about you know, there's this element of sort of competition and, and conflict that is at play but also very much is you know, the, the place of ritual and play itself. Um, and if the drawing of borders is about, well, you know, how do we call, how do we turn neighbors into strangers? You know, let's yeah. just, let's look at Belfast, for instance, where there are literally 150 doors that clang shut at night, every night, and don't open at the weekends because they're divi uh, dividing communities physically from each other. Is, is play and, and what forms of play are a possibility for us to remember how to, yeah. to live together again. Um, and I think that's kind of the, those aspects of hope. So those uh, combating aircraft, they're sharing the same sky or the, the light that comes through to political prisoners in the work of, say, Sophia Karim. It's, you know, we share the same light. Uh, so how, how do we turn and what, what can artists help us do is to capture that bits of hope um, and, and make sure we, we keep that with us. 
Yeah. With that, I think it's really important that we stop uh, <laughs> so that those of you who haven't seen uh, Fiona's wonderful film uh, and the overall exhibition have the chance to do so. Uh, but before we do, just take this opportunity to thank Fiona for, for coming up, for sharing <laughs> her wonderful work with us. Thank you. And thanks to the, the terrific team at uh, the Herbert, in particular Kirsty, uh, for organizing all of this for to, you know, to make technology run uh, so flawlessly. Uh, hats off to you, Kirsty, and, and the whole you. team here. Thank you. Thank you for Thank coming. You. Can, can I also just add, um, Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm really touched that you came on a Saturday, and thanks for your time. It's been it's lovely of you. There's also a catalogue on the way out, if, if you'd like one. <laughs>